Hi, this is Lance Culver, and this is going to be a tie flow tutorial. This video is part two of creating an electrical effect. If you have not seen the previous video, I would highly recommend checking out that video first. You'll find a link to it in the description or follow the link that's in the upper right hand corner of the screen. But picking up where we left off. All right, so if we wanted to add additional objects into the scene, for example, we could take a copy of this box and then add it to the position object. We would also need to add it to the object bind and to the surface forces. And then into the ray casting of each set target. And as long as there's enough distance in between them, the object bind won't confuse tie flow. Let's say we create a plane. But if we were to just add the plane the same way we did the second box, uh, we would end up with some undesirable results in the last particles as a result of the object bind confusing tie flow with which surface it thinks the particle should be on. So what we can do is let's add a spawn operator into the targets event and then create a new event. Now let's add a position object and pick the plane. Now let's place these particles on a different simulation group. Let's say simulation group two. Now let's go into the set target and enable it to search for particles on group two. And we can do the same thing for these other set targets. So now we have it set up where the particles that are on the boxes are on group one and the particles that are on the ground are on group two. So now we need to be able to collect that information so that essentially tie flow is going to ask each target particle what group it's on. So what we can do is let's add a custom properties into the top of the bind particles event. And then let's come down here under float data and change it to simulation groups. And now let's create a channel here called target group. And because we want to collect the simulation group of our target particle, let's change the value here under data source to target. So again, what this is going to do is ask TIEFLOW to check to see which simulation group our target particle is on. Let's select this property test that sends the last particle into the all particles event and open filters, enable filters, and let's add a custom float. And then we'll say if it is equal to one and let's change the channel to target group now let's make a copy of this property test and drop it beneath it and then open filters select the custom float and let's change the value to two and then open test action and let's change the name of this channel from last one to last two and now let's connect this property test to the all particles event. So just to recap really quick what we just set up was with this custom properties, every particle that gets resampled off of the spawn particle is assigned a custom data channel called target group. And the value of that channel is the simulation group that our target particle is on and the target particle was set by this set target. And then this property test, which only sends out last particles, will check to see if that last particle has a target group value of one. And if it does, it'll send it through. So therefore, it's targeting a particle on one of these boxes. And then this property test is obviously checking to see if it has a value of two, which would be the value if the target was a particle that was set on group two. And one thing I should mention really quick, uh, because I'm talking about it, and I don't want you to get confused later once you start to use this, when using custom properties to determine the simulation group of a target particle, because we set our particles on group one and two, it was easy to just come into the property test and then search for the value here, one or two. But if we would have set our particles on group three and then over here in the filter, if we would have made this a three, it would not return true. And that's because to tie flow, it looks at this as possible combinations. So the first possible combination you can have is a single group on one. So that will return a value of one. The next possible combination is a two, and that will return a value of two. But the next possible combination of these is not a three, it's a one and a two. 
So this will return a value of three. And then the next would be just the three by itself. And that will return a value of four. And then the next combination would be a three and a one, three and a two, and so on and so forth. And then there are thousands and thousands of possible combinations. But again, because we used one and two, it was easy enough to just search for one and two. Oh, but now what we also need to do is select the spawn particles event. And then here under evaluation priority, let's give it a priority of two. The reason why we did that was because of the way Typhlo evaluates events. By setting this to evaluation priority two, it ensures that this event is evaluated before this because we need the particles that are on group two to be evaluated before this set target executes. So now what we can do is take a copy of this object bind and then drop it beneath it and remove the two boxes and then pick the plane and now let's open the filters, select the custom float, and change the channel to last two. Then we can also add the plane to the surface forces. Probably need to reduce the numbers a little bit. Let's say if we go into the split, reduce this down to maybe 4%. And then into this other split, maybe reduce it down to 1.5. All right, now let's go ahead and add a splines path. And we will change it from trajectories to particle bindings. And then create new. All right, then let's come over here under the modify panel and enable the tie splines mesher. Let's reduce the radius down to let's say 0.15, maybe 0.1. And then open the tie splines. And then enable weld bindings. And we can also enable filters. Let's add a custom float. Say if it is equal to one and change the channel to spread. So now that splines paths is only going to apply over particles that have a custom data channel called spread with a value of one. Now we can make a copy of this splines pass and drop it in here beneath it. Open the filters, change the custom float to contact. And then we can also, let's just say, make a copy and then paste a couple more copies in here. And then we'll select this second one here and change it to last one. Select the third one and change it to last two and then change it to or, and then create new, and then enable the tie splines mesher. Open tie splines, come down and enable weld bindings, and then under the tie splines mesher, reduce the radius down to about one, And then here under taper, let's reduce the amount. And now let's reduce the radius. Just play with this a little bit until we get it. down here. You could easily, by adding new distance to targets, you could add a new section of these particles to create different branches. Like for example, we could cut off 
writing about here and have these particles in between the contact particles and that cutoff point only target particles that are within a specific radius of the target particle or you know or, or even a radius of just this particle but keep the branches that are at the end much closer and then you could have this section here target particles that are outside that radius there's several ways you can add functionality to this thing just by keeping in mind where to put what in here like for example i've got a little bit of electric look to it but we wanted to add a little bit more of a bend to this thing just by understanding how this is set up we could add a spread operator in here beneath these two sibling property tests, but above the distance to target property test that sends the bulk of the particles into the split particles event. Change the noise type to curl, give it some kind of strength. Reduce the scale down, maybe five. That's not gonna be applying a force, it's just spreading the particles some. So that's going to wrap up this one. I do have another video that is a very similar technique, a little bit more of an advanced setup than this one, but it builds upon the same principles. So be sure to check the link that's in the description or the one that's on the screen now. I really do appreciate you taking the time to watch the video. And again, I realize this can be quite confusing if you're new to TieFlow. So if you are having any problems, feel free to leave a comment. If you like the video, please hit the like button. And if you haven't done so already, please subscribe. But until next time, I hope you have a great day. Thanks again. See ya.